So our first uh, bill is House File 677, and um, I will move that House File 677 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus finance bill, although there is some policy here, so we'll kind of na navigate that uh, here. It may end up in a, po some of the policy may end up in a policy bill, but the main thing is that we're hearing this uh, today. And just before you start, uh, Representative Elkins, and I know we'll have other people talking about Bill Dooley, but I, I wanted the committee to know that, you know, from time to time we've uh, <clears throat> named bills uh, in, in honor of uh, someone who has, um, uh, made significant contributions to transportation or the, the topic of discussion. And uh, Bill Dooley uh, passed away um, earlier this year and um, was a real champion of the issue that we're about to talk about. Uh, an incredible guy. I, I had the chance to know him and work with him. Uh, we had wonderful conversations over many years. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I especially appreciate that he was sort of a one-person clipping service. Uh, if there's ever anything topical on issues of transportation, particularly transit and active transportation, I know I would hear from Bill. Uh, and his family is here, and we're, we're really honored to have you here as well. So with that, um, Representative Elkins, uh, please let us know about House File 677. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I do have uh, an amendment to offer. OK. Uh, you can Oops. offer your A1, A1 amendment. amendment. Yep. I will, I'll move that, even though you're on the committee, you can yeah. move it too. We'll both move it. Yeah, and. No, I'm what, moving it. Mr. Uh, Chair. It's like, what? Yeah, the, uh, this, please let us know about the A1. Yes, the A1, uh, we're, for now, we're taking out the, uh, there are two speed limit um, provisions in the bill, and we're going to take those out for now. Uh, there's a, a new edition of the manual on uniform traffic control devices coming out this spring that will give uh, quite a bit more leeway in setting speed limits than the, uh, than the current manual does. And we're engaged in uh, productive conversations uh, with the uh, engineering associations in MnDOT and uh, would like to just t take this out for now until we have those conversations. Okay, uh, the A1 is before us uh, that I have moved. Uh, is there discussion? Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion prevails. So now we have uh, House File 677 as amended before us. Yeah. Proceed. Thank you. Um, for, for those of you who have been on this committee uh, before, uh, I will be uh, channeling a, a longtime member of this committee named Connie Bernardi, who is also still is a, uh, a tireless advocate for bicycle and act, uh, safety and, and active transportation issues. And uh, when she uh, retired last year, she asked me to uh, pick up the torch and, and carry it. Uh, I've also worked on active transportation and bicycle safety stuff for a long time, too. So happy to be channeling Connie this morning, but I'm going to let uh, uh, Dorian Grilly, the head of uh, Bike Minnesota, do most of the presenting this morning. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grilly, and welcome to the committee. And I'll also add that, uh, you know, active transportation, which is, uh, includes bike, walk, and, and other non-motorized modes, is really all part of a multimodal approach to transportation that we're taking in this committee. And I appreciate all of your work over the years in promoting that. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Hornstein, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dorian Grilly. I'm the Executive Director of the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. Thank you very much for hearing this bill, and thank you, Representative Elkins, for being the chief author. Uh, bill Dooley was the hub that many things related to bicycling in Minneapolis, the metropolitan area, Minnesota, uh, and Minnesota revolved around. Uh, he retired at 55 from his job as an insurance industry lobbyist to serve his community. He was an avid reader and endless source of information, as the chair pointed out, and analysis on issues related to biking, walking, and transit uh, for all of his advocacy friends. He was a member of the Minneapolis Bicycle Advisory Committee, the Shared Use Mobility Collaborative, and a longtime member of our board of directors and the chair of our advocacy committee. Uh, he was involved in lots of other nonprofit and advocacy collaboratives. And his wife, Susan, daughters, Laura and Shana, are here today. And on behalf of them and all his friends and advocacy partners, thank you for entering his name into the permanent record of the state of Minnesota legislature. Uh, Article 2 of the bill 
uh, I think is perhaps the most important part, and I think Bill would have thought so too. Uh, if you read his obituary uh, uh, that was in the Star Tribune on Friday or Saturday, I think, um, uh, he talked about going by schools and seeing kids doing their bike safety training outside and just thinking that was the greatest thing. Um, so Article 2 of the bill changes may, schools may provide student safety education for bicycling and pedestrian safety to must. It also defines the program. The Bicycle Alliance feels that bike education and community engagement are essential investments that are needed to maximize the return on investment on infrastructure. About 10 years ago, the Bicycle Alliance worked with Blue Cross Blue Shields Center for Prevention, MnDOT, and a steering committee to develop an elementary school safety curriculum called Walk Bike Fun. Since then, we have contracted with MnDOT to implement the curriculum, uh, and we've been working with schools and public health professionals throughout the state to train educators to use it. To date, we've trained about 1,000 who are delivering it to about 100,000 kids per year. I envision Walk Bike Fund to be the maximum a school would choose to implement as part of this change. Although we have helped many expand that to teaching learn to ride. Um, at a minimum, pedestrian safety is already required as part of bus safety. So I envision that all we would be adding is a few minutes of bike safety uh, training, discussing something like this bookmark, which says, follow the law, be predictable, be aware, be visible, and save your brain. Of course, make the choice to wear a helmet. The bookmarks are already available in Hmong, Spanish, Somali, and English, as are several learn, learn at home handouts. We'll work with MnDOT and the Safe Routes to School <coughs> Steering Committee to edit and condense them into a one-pager that could also go home in backpacks. That's pretty much it. A bookmark, a flyer, and a few minutes of school time once a year would be the minimum that you're requiring with that may to must change. I probably don't need to tell you that there are lots of studies that show schools show that kids engaged in daily physical activity are happier, healthier, and more focused learners at school. A recent study of schools across the country found that schools that had infrastructure improvements saw 18% more kids biking and walking to school. Ones that had education saw a 25% increase, and ones that did both saw a 31% increase. As I said, active transportation education is a great investment. Article 3 of the bill does a lot of transporta active transportation policy stuff. Section 1 requires agencies and governments to cooperate and MnDOT to continue to lead that effort and coordinate by providing active transportation design guidelines, active transportation planning, and technical assistance to local units of government. I might add that we think MnDOT is doing a pretty good job of this right now. We just want to make sure that that's the case uh, well into the future. Section 2 reinserts the Active Transportation Advisory Committee as an advisor on the state bike route system. The committee, which was allowed to sunset a few years ago, is reauthorized later in the bill. Sections 3 and 4 establish the Mississippi River Trail and the Jim Oberstar Route, now known as the North Star Route, as state bikeways. Um, this, the state bike route system has already been authorized, so we're basically just saying these need to be officially designated as state bike routes. Section 5 is about passing a bicycle. Chapter 169.18, subdivisions 3 and 5, should say the th same thing, but they don't right now. This resolves that by saying that the passing distance when overtaking bicycles requires at least three feet or half the width of a vehicle uh, in both subdivisions. So it's basically a technical correction. The change in section six is a national be best practice that was shared with us by the National Conference of State Legislatures and many national bike organizations. 
It changes the poorly understood and inconsistently enforced as far to the right as practicable language in the operation of a bicycle statute to as far to the right as the bicycle operator determines is safe. And if you've driven Jackson Street, you uh, north of uh, uh, university here, you know that riding as far to the right as practicable uh, is not possible on Jackson Street. There's gigantic potholes. Um, so anyway, I, I, I strongly recommend that change. Also from NCSL in section six, um, it makes it legal for bicyclists to proceed straight through an intersection from a right turn lane without turning right. It's, this is also a, another national best practice. I know bicyclists are not often getting ticketed for doing this, and it is a best practice on a busy road with a wide shoulder that periodically becomes a right turn lane. But current law says that you must merge out into the traffic lane, go around the right turn lane, and if you don't and get hit by someone turning left, it's your fault. Um, so uh, I don't think we should potentially penalize bicyclists for doing the best practice and something that is generally widely accepted. Section seven is the stop as yield for bicycles also at, referred to as the Idaho stop. This language also came from the NSL and is now law in 12 <clears throat> other states. It would allow a bicyclist to not come to a complete stop, still requires a bicyclist to slow, make sure that the intersection is safe to go through, um, and then proceed without coming to a complete stop. We think this is a best practice that will actually help law enforcement decide when to stop a bicyclist. We certainly do not support bicyclists blowing through stop signs. Section eight reauthorizes the MnDOT Active Transportation Advisory Committee that I mentioned earlier was allowed to sunset. The expense will be minimal and given that we are all accustomed to zooming around the state in two dimensions, I don't think there'll have to be many in-person meetings although I think it'd be nice if they did that once or twice a year. Section nine requires the first 500,000 appropriated for active transportation to be spent to develop and maintain and implement an active transportation safety curriculum for youth. So, you know, hopefully if it is, becomes uh, a must do for schools, MnDOT will have the capacity uh, to to implement that and work with the Bicycle Alliance to do so uh, with that uh, recommendation. I previously said we think the return on investment in education is very, very high. Infrastructure costs millions of dollars. Educating people how to safely use the existing infrastructure in our community costs an order of magnitude less. Article four, appropriation appropriates funds for active transportation. It appropriates 10 million a year for safe routes to school and 25 million for active transportation as an ongoing appropriation in the base budget. This is done with the intention of funding much of the match for the federal transportation alternatives program and increasing program as well as infrastructure investment. MnDOT has recently issued an RFP for active transportation, and they also had um, uh, request, uh, requested letters of intent, I believe, beforehand. They are expecting proposals to add up to 10 times the amount of money they have available. To me, that means MnDOT, the Statewide Health Improvement Partnership, the Bicycle Alliance, and many others have done a great job helping communities statewide understand the value of these investments in active transportation and safe routes to school that we are asking the legislature to make. There's little doubt that the re return on investment will be high. Thank you very much for your time this morning. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Grilly. Uh, are there questions for Mr. Grilly? Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question regarding the change from the word shall to may regarding the training for the schools. Mm -hmm. um, is there any extra funding available other, outside of grants? Are we providing anything to the schools 
Um, also, how would this affect uh, potentially uh, East Chain School District, which was a school district in my uh, in my house uh, seat, where the nearest home to that school was over half a mile away um, in the countryside. Right. Um, how many students do you expect are biking to school in the country? I lived five miles away from a school when I was in uh, when I was growing up, and I never once rode my bike to school, and uh, never really rode my bike outside of the farmyard area and still don't. So can you explain how this mandate to schools, uh, and also how many schools are not currently doing this? Because I remember when I was in elementary school, there was still bus, there was school bus training, pedestrian training, and there was bike safety training. Although it didn't really make any difference to me, I wasn't riding a bike. Correct. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Olson, um, uh, I don't think it'd make a lot of difference uh, in the, you know, those kids riding to school. Um, but the idea is simply that those kids um, should be able to learn how to use the existing infrastructure in their community safely. Meaning they might not use it to bike to school, but the kids who live in the community would be able to ride around town. Um, and the kids, uh, and, and we've now added middle school lessons. So maybe the kids that choose to ride uh, from town out to the school could do so safely. Or you could get an infrastructure grant and make a trail like Wabasha has done for their school, which is about a mile south of the densely developed part of town. Um, as far as the money goes, I think the cost would be minimal, as I mentioned, um, but I think there'll be a fiscal note as part of this that will go uh, uh, as part of the transportation finance uh, omnibus bill. and. Uh, I think the appropriations that we're talking about here in MnDOT's general fund base would easily cover that. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just really quick follow-up. So I appreciate that. I, I don't disagree with the fact that students should know how to ride a bike safely, should know how to be a pedestrian safely. You know, I walk across the street regularly. Mm -hmm. So these things are important. Um, but what I, I'm always fearful of is I used to teach. I was a teacher for eight years uh, in southern Minnesota. And my biggest fear is when we're providing these unfunded mandates to schools. So when, when we're talking about there is a fiscal note, there will be allocations to these schools to provide that training. That's, that's, a great, that's a great thing. It's a great sign. We have arguments on the floor regularly about how some study is going to cost $2,000, and that study then puts it non-germane to the bill because it expands the scope and sequence of this. So this is where we should take care of it on the front end. So then when we're on the House floor, we don't have an argument about the 2,000 extra dollars it's going to take because it takes, you know, it takes five minutes of your time to have the training and you're taking it out of the school day and the teachers are getting paid. But wait, is it really that way? But the teachers are all salaried, so we don't have that argument. So I'd appreciate if we take care of it here so we can make sure that these schools are funded, even though it is a 30 minute class to train these kids to be safe on their bicycles. Sure. And I'm. Thank you, Representative Wilson, for those questions and points. Uh, I think we have both uh, folks up here want to respond. Representative Elkins. Yeah, just real, <clears throat> real quick, we did put the uh, education portions of this bill through the Education Policy Committee last week as House File 678. So. And Mr. Chair, Representative Wilson, really. members of the committee, um, uh, about half the schools in Minnesota right now are choosing to implement yeah. the much uh, more substantial curriculum than just the bookmark and a flyer going home in the backpack. It takes more than a week. Uh, it actually is a week of uh, uh, on-bike safety training um, with FIAD, in FIAD class in many schools. And MnDOT, bless their hearts, or the Statewide Health Improvement Partnership has provided bike fleets. And we will deliver the bikes, a, a, a trailer full of bikes to your school for free um, and train the teachers for free and pay, sub pay um, for when they're away from class um, to take that walk bike fund training. So we've been doing it for about 10 years and uh, it's really quite widely accepted. Thank you for those questions, Representative Olson. Representative Murphy and then Representative Petersburg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in my area, the largest city is 3,500 people, uh, but it's Perm, and it drops off a lot after that. I mean, our average town is two to 500 people. 
Mm -hmm. um, how do you see uh, this program really benefiting the majority of the towns in my area? And my, I guess my follow-up is that uh, it looks like this is more of a local concern rather than a statewide directive. So I'm just curious how you think it might benefit mine. We already have we already had ed education on all of those. So how do you see it helping out my my district? Uh, Mr. Grilly. Mr. Chair, Representative Murphy. Many of the small school districts uh, in Minnesota are already using the walk bike front curriculum and and you know they're consolidated school districts and I think the way it benefits um, children is you know they grow up and go away many of them will grow up and go away to college or move to the city and it gives them a start as to what um, and the other thing is a, a, a personal one my son uh, said, you know, Dad, I didn't really realize all the things you were trying to teach me about bicycling until I took driving, driver safety. Um, so it's a head start on driver safety. And I think that's a very, very good investment. I understand the part uh, about the education and the safety, but my question is built a little bit more about how do we get our money's worth out of this investment from the state in our, my district? Mr. Grilly. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Murphy, I really think that it's, it's a combination of public health and just simply kids' safety. That uh, right now you require bus safety uh, in state statute that includes pedestrian safety. Uh, almost every kid rides a bicycle and it's a good idea, uh, especially in small communities where there aren't uh, oh, isn't a lot of bicycle infrastructure, so they're riding in the streets. I think it's best to teach them at a very young age what the rules are for riding in the street. Thank, Thank you. Uh, we have Representative Petersburg, then Representative Kraft, then Representative Brand, and then we have one more testifier on this bill, and so then we'll move on after okay. that. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just, just asking if Mr. Grill would be available when we talk about the final bill, if necessary. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, Representative Petersburg, um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll f uh, finish up with our questions, we, and then we have another testifier, and then if you want to save your question yep. for that, we'll, uh, we'll move on. Uh, Representative Kraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to follow up on the question asked by Representative Murphy, because, and maybe you could help me here, I'm not sure to, but part of this bill is an appropriation for funding that includes construction of, and maintenance of bike trail and pedestrian infrastructure. So is, it, is that also a way that this could benefit districts potentially in Mr. Murphy's district? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Kraft, I think that's certainly the case. Okay. Um, putting this into MnDOT's base budget would make, uh, and they do small, you know, they try and target uh, uh, small communities with a significant portion of their grant funding. Uh, and the other great thing about this is it's state money, not federal money. So the, the procedure for applying for this money is a lot easier than it would be if it was only the federal money, which is coming to the state right now. And uh, do you have a follow-up? No, thank you. Okay, and I, I uh, believe that's through the IIJA uh, mm -hmm. Package so, um, actually, it's called uh, Safe Communities uh, Funding. Well, actually, it's been an ongoing uh, appropriation as part of the federal transportation bill since the early 1990s, called Transportation Alternatives. Okay, um, and it's about 75 million a year that comes to Minnesota that can only be spent on uh, those transportation alternatives, which include biking and walking. Thank you. All right, our last committee question for now is uh, Representative Brand. Well, we'll always turn back to Representative Petersburg. Representative Brand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a quick question. You know, there's a lot of great components to this bill. Of course, you know, the James or the Jim Oberstar Bikeway, of course, is a, um, a recognition of the uh, champion that Jim Oberstar was in transportation here in Minnesota. Um, a quick question about that. And so, if you don't have the information, if you could send it to me, but are we using existing infrastructure along like I-35 to get to Duluth and then points north? Uh, I know there's a portion where there's no bike trail between, um, I think it's 
either two harbors or Lutzen or something like that to Grand Marais itself. There's no bike infrastructure, so they'd probably be using Highway 61. But if you have a map or something that I could help use to visualize it, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Brand, there is a map already on MnDOT's website. Yes. And it's one that is constantly being edited as shoulders are being added to roads. And you are absolutely right. There is not a solid off-road connection from here to Duluth or uh, from the Iowa border to Lake Itasca. Um, but it uses uh, bikeable roads. Uh, some people don't think the 12-foot shoulder on Highway 61 is the most desirable uh, south of the Twin Cities. But uh, uh, they've done some wonderful things in, Wap or in Lake City. You know, they just, MnDOT, as they rebuilt uh, Highway 61 through Lake City, it now has bike lanes. It's a four to three conversion. Uh, Reps and Brand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the other thing I would say is just, um, I'm impressed with um, how, Im how important it is to have, you know, the Lake Superior Hiking Trail up there in Cook County and Lake County and St. Louis County to the local economies. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is also gonna help provide that opportunity to increase the uh, benefits to the economy up there as well. Just one more. Mr. Grilly. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I was told by a hotel owner in Wabasha that they have three to five bicyclists riding the Mississippi River Trail a week, and that that was the difference between having a profitable week and a, and a, a flat week. So you're absolutely right. Uh, as more and more people start using these facilities, it will have a significant impact on the local economies. Thank you, and I would just add to members of the committee, I, uh, on national night out, um, I always bike around uh, my district. It's, uh, it's compact that way. Um, and I carry highway maps and MnDOT bike maps. And I will tell you that there was a lot of interest in the, the MnDOT bike maps. So a little, little tip for national night out or other community events, people really do like to have those, those maps. And you can get them from MnDOT, highway and bike. I would make a public service announcement there. Um, so we have uh, one more testifier, and then after the testifier, Representative Petersburg will return back to your questions. Is that how you'd like to handle it? It doesn't matter. I just wanted to make sure, Mr. Chair, if we need to, we can bring Okay. Well, back. I wonder if uh, if you have a question specifically for Mr. Grilly. I, I don't. Oh, yes. okay. Okay. But he'll be available. He right. will be available. Okay. Uh, great. Um, so we have uh, another testifier uh, signed up. Uh, Lewis Moore is... Oh. Oh. And I'm sorry, Chair Hornstein, I forgot to tell you that uh, Louie's wife is sick this morning. He's okay. not able to come. Okay. He was a dear friend of Bill uh, and just wanted to say a few words about okay. Bill. Well, you know, this, uh, this is maybe a good opportunity to remind the committee and especially our, our first year folks that, um, you know, we will be returning to this bill um, again. Um, uh, it will be incorporated in one or both of our omnibus bills or parts of it. So there'll be another opportunity to uh, discuss it uh, at that time when we do markup. So if, Mr. If, Ms. if Lewis is available, we could have him then. Uh, okay, is, uh, is there any, any additional committee discussion or questions or comments? Uh, oh, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm, I'm correct. This is going to be laid over possible inclusion. Correct. All right. Thank you. And I'm wondering if um, if somebody from the department could come up and answer a few questions about implementation and uh, and what's going on with this. I see, Mr. Rudine. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with uh, answering questions from Mr. Petersburg. Uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I thought he was testifying. You. I forgot you were doing a question. I think, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Rudine, uh, I know that there had been um, an advisory committee like this before that was sunsetted. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, first of all, um, has there been any follow-up in regards to doing what this this committee or advisory council is doing after the sunset, and how is that different than the active transportation program that's it currently in um, underneath the department's responsibility? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Eric Rudine with MnDOT Government Affairs, and um, you're correct that the the former uh, committee did sunset. However. 
Uh, we do have um, sort of informal advisory <coughs> committees for both the Safe Routes to School program and the Active Transportation program. And I think we would envision this new committee sort of uh, taking over the responsibilities for those two existing committees. So uh, in effect, I think the way we would operate it is, you know, those separate committees would sort of cease to exist and, and the issues that they deal with would, would be uh, taken over by this new committee. Representative Petersburg. M Mr. Chair, so I'll, I'll get back to that. Uh, but at this point, the way I see the bill, it requires the department to provide staffing uh, for this particular committee. Uh, and it doesn't look like they get reimbursement for costs, but the other people do. What kind of staff numbers do you think the department will need to provide since we don't have a fiscal note with any kind of assumptions here at this point? Mr. Rudin. Uh Mr. Chair and Representative Petersburg, I, um, I probably need to get a, a little more detail from our uh, Office of Transit and Active Transportation on that. But um, again, I think they're currently providing support to, to both the Safe Routes to School program uh, and the Active Transportation program out of both the Office of Transit and the Office of State Aid, which administers uh, a lot of these grants as well. So I, I don't know that it would necessarily be uh, you know, a significant amount of increased responsibility uh, for, for MnDOT staff. I think maybe just kind of a refocusing um, of, of some of the uh, things that they're doing today. Thank you, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair. We have one Go more ahead. question. Uh, yeah, uh, first a comment, and then then a final sure. question for the department. Um, and and that is that I'm sure that you will get us a fiscal note and stuff before you you mark this up. Is that correct, Mr. Chair? Uh, Go ahead. No, I'm, sorry, I'm assuming. Um, no, I'm just I'm, I'm assuming that we will finally get a fiscal note when regards to the cost for this right. and yep. all the assumptions for that, yep. because I think that's important for us to to know that in this fiscal policy to do that. My last question to Mr. Rodine is that I know currently there is a uh, transportation advisory council um, that is involved with vehicle miles traveled and and some other things that are really designed for longer term issues that aren't necessarily bike related. Seems like, this seems like, according to the title, like it's very similar. Are these separate? Are they gonna stay separate? Are they gonna be combined? Uh, what is what is the thought on the department side? I think, uh, thank you, Representative Beers. I think you're referring to the Sustainable Transportation right. Advisory Committee. Right. Uh, Mr. Rudine. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, that, that's correct. We have a Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee, and um, you know, the, as you pointed out, that, that group is really focused on sort of long-term um, efforts to, to re reduce uh, impacts to the environment of, of uh, transportation. And so certainly a piece of that is you know, having um, bicycle and pedestrian networks so that people can make trips uh, through bike ped uh, activities rather than, you know, getting in a, a vehicle and, and traveling by themselves. Uh, so I, I would say that the work is, you know, it's certainly related, but I think it's distinct enough that the, the stack, as we refer to it, Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee, would continue even with the creation of this committee, which would be really focused in on, on, on these two programs. All right, thank you, and quick, one quick sure, question. Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, this bill also puts a fair amount of dollars um, into the base from general fund, and so I'm gonna reserve my discussion for that when it gets put into the bill, and, and once we find targets and so forth, Correct. because that, um, that's yes. a big deal. Yes, uh, putting uh, it this is, uh, and I was having a conversation with Representative Elkins about this very issue mm -hmm. uh, today, and, um, you know, this is obviously going to be, um, I, I would venture to guess, um, you know, this, this figure will be changed or altered based on, on our target. So it's, it's a point well taken, Representative Petersburg, and, uh, you know, I, I think you can expect some, uh, some additional uh, variation All right. based you. on that. But, but I, I would say that in, in the past, uh, you know, we have, uh, used par a portion of our general fund target for this purpose, and and I I would certainly support some portion of it going to an ongoing base allocation for this purpose. Um, 
Okay, maybe let's have closing comments from both Mr. Grilly and Representative Elkins, and we'll move on to our next bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, I just wanted to say that I personally serve on the MnDOT Safe Routes to School Advisory Committee and the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee. And uh, I think Mr. Rudin is correct. Uh, there wouldn't be, uh, uh, the, the staff is already providing uh, all the, as I said, I think MnDOT's doing a really good job right now. Um, and, and also, I really believe that uh, the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council's recommendation also includes bike education because of that strong return on investment. Um, and my closing thought is that the policy, some of the policy stuff in this bill was passed by this committee in 2018 and passed by the uh, uh, Minnesota House 122 to nothing. So it's, it's not really controversial. So thank you very much. Thank you. And closing comments from the author. Uh, no, th uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks uh, for the, to the committee for uh, consideration. Wonderful. Okay, well, um, did you initially move this bill, or did I? I don't remember. Uh, you did. Okay, so I will renew my motion that House File 677, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in a future omnibus transportation finance and or policy bill. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay.